yes, the time has come for the FDL2 review. This is a blaster that has gained a lot of popularity in the flywheeler community, in the NERP hobby lately, um, and it does a whole lot. We've got a lot to get into. Now, before I get into this, I do just want to say, uh, this is not mine. This is Thundercrunks, who let me borrow it for an extended period to get to use it in games and really get a feel for it and how it all functions, and a uh, big thank you to him for that. But that actually leads me to an interesting point that I feel like I get to have a unique view of this blaster because um, I didn't pay for this, but I'm not keeping it either. So I feel like I don't really have a bias one way or the other. Not that anybody who reviews one that purchases one or, or whatnot may have a bias one way or the other consciously. It's just something that can tend to happen when you're excited about something that you're purchasing. So I feel like this uh, may put me in a unique position to be able to review one of these in that scenario. So, with that said, this is a premium product. And with a premium product comes a premium price. And because of that, I will get a little bit nitpicky because I feel like for a premium price, you should get the best bang for your buck. With that said, let's get into it. Let's start with the pros. There's a lot of good to say about this blaster for good reason. It's popular because it does a lot of things very well. One of those things is flexibility. Now you have a screen back here with a knob and a button, and this allows you to change all kinds of settings on your blaster. This will give you access to uh, your spin-up speed. So if you want something really quick and snappy on your button push, then you can get that little bit of snappiness in a trade-off for a little bit of power on your first shot. Or you can go straight full power for everything and just give yourself the biggest bang for your buck uh, on the first shot, but you will sacrifice a little bit of speed in terms of snappiness of shot. Now it's important to note when I'm talking about these spin-up times and all of that, this mostly relates to the initial shot when the wheels are not spinning at all, because follow-up shots do tend to be much, much snappier as the wheels all are already moving and in motion so they pick up way faster and it has a much more of an instantaneous type feeling in terms of response. Also, it is really cool that you can take and set three presets with all of your settings. You can quickly toggle between them using the menu settings. Uh, you can also change your rate of fire. Uh, you can get up to around 13 darts per second with this blaster, I believe, when it's fully like pushed to the limit. Uh, and you can also get up to about 170 FPS. I was just a bit shy of it in my testing, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are people that have hit that 170 mark. I seem to be averaging about 165 to 168 which is not bad for flywheelers that's for sure and that's where the flexibility comes in is that you can push it to that limit or you can scale it down for something like end war down to 130 or uh, I believe terminal infection was like a 100 FPS cap and they scaled it down to that so there's a lot of cool features in terms of how you control things with this and beyond just being able to control things like FPS and rate of fire, there are also three uh, settings in terms of how you shoot. So you can do single fire, you can do burst fire, and you can do full auto. So it's nice that that functionality is available and you have those options for whichever way you want to go with this. And that power, it's definitely not to be underestimated. Uh, the power from the brushless motors inside this blaster, and interestingly enough, the 3D printed flywheels, which is not something you commonly see in this hobby. Now we are starting to see a little bit of people testing, experimenting, but because these are brushless motors, you can get a better secure uh, fixture for those flywheels on this blaster. The setup on this blaster allows for a good level of accuracy. I'm not gonna make the claim that it's the best in the world in terms of flywheelers or anything like that, but it's solid, it's good, it feels good when you use it, and that is a major plus. Having confidence in your blaster allows you to play much better on the field, so that's definitely, definitely important. Uh, it's one other thing that actually leads me to one of my next points is the build quality on this is just fantastic. It feels very sturdy. It feels good and solid in your hand. Um, the print quality is very, very nice. There's a lot of times you can get prints from people that haven't quite fine-tuned things and they don't look or feel the greatest. These, these are up there. They're very good quality prints and I really appreciate that, especially on a premium product. Again, going back to that. 
you expect a certain level of quality with a product of this price range and it doesn't disappoint in that area. So kudos to Project FDL on that point. One other thing in terms of build quality that I absolutely love is the way you can take this blaster apart. Um, I experienced a jam, which apparently is a rare thing. I only experienced one jam in my testing, which I've had this for over a month at this point. And uh, I was able to just pull this bottom section off right here under the flywheels and access into the flywheels without pulling the entire blaster apart. I thought that was super cool and I love that design. I think that is a very nice touch and something that I hope they continue with uh, in terms of designing their future blasters. Now, those are the pros. Let's talk some of the cons. Right off the bat, when you pick this blaster up, it's beefy. You can feel it. It's got heft. It's solid. And that's in some ways a plus, but in other ways, it, it's heavy. It's a heavy blaster compared to things like a Stripe or other blasters its size. So that is something that you'll have to take into consideration. As I noticed after a day of playing this, it, it started to feel weighty. And that can be a bit of a downside. It's not something that's going to make or break a purchase for me, but it is going to make me consider certain aspects. And that's something that is worth thinking about because I don't think it gets talked about all that often. The next thing to talk about is the grip. It is, it's not a great grip in terms of comfort and size. It's a bit big. I've got decently sized hands with long fingers and it's still a bit of a stretch for me. So that's a bit of a downside in my opinion. Um, one other little detail about it is there is this screw port down here at the bottom that it, it digs right into my hand and it's not super comfortable, especially with the weight of the blaster. It starts to, it starts to get a little uncomfortable the more and more I use it. And that's a bit of a bummer during an extended play session. So it's something to, to take into consideration uh, when you're thinking about this. Now, I understand why this is the way it is and it, it, it leads to something that I think is very interesting and that is the battery compartment, which I think is super clever. Uh, this little part pops right open and you've got a compartment in there for your battery, which that is so cool to me that not only is the ability to put the battery in your grip appealing, but also he made a channel through the handguard to connect to your XT60 connector and just have it all right in there encased. And I think that is a super clever, cool design. So major props on that. However, it leads to some downsides for me. Um, one of the major downsides besides the size of the grip and it potentially being a little uncomfortable for certain people is that I love being able to use my main hand for my mag release, and I cannot do that here. Um, simply put, it's, it's, it's impossible. Unless they design some sort of lever to go up and around and all that and out, which I'm not sure how that would work. But regardless, it leads to the mag release. Being a mag release, like a button push mag release on the base of the mag wheel here that I'm not, not the biggest fan of. Um, I've never been a huge fan of this kind because I feel like it slows your reload down. Uh, but again, it's a design trade-off for being able to put the battery in the grip here and not having it add bulk somewhere else. So it's a tough design decision. Now for the FDL3, which has been discussed that is in works, I'm really hoping that the battery moves from the grip to maybe inside a built-in stock or something like that, because that would allow the grip to be a better shape and comfort feel. I mean, really, they didn't have much to work with in terms of how to make this grip comfortable with a battery compartment inside of it. So there weren't many options for them when they made that decision, which again, clever, but leads to some downsides. Um, I know there is a lever mag release that you can get and print out for this, but again, it still requires the offhand to be involved in the process, which again, can slow your reloads down in my opinion for my, at least my personal play style. But that is maybe, maybe leaning a little bit more towards the personal preferences point, which we'll get to uh, after the cons and talk a little bit more about that. Um, but moving on from that, let's talk about spin-up time. 
I mentioned a little bit earlier in terms of flexibility, but spin up time if you want a high powered shot right off the bat is a very real concern because you will have spin up time, a considerable amount. Now I was planning on doing it in slow motion and counting the frames and getting a very precise reading, uh, but my main camera is still broken out for repairs, so can't do that, unfortunately. Maybe I'll test it in the future and add on to it and things like that, but uh, it, it's, it's not horrible for the people that don't mind it, but for me personally, it's a con. It's a con, and again, getting into the personal preferences, we'll talk a little bit about why after this section. But one last thing I wanna talk about in terms of cons for me is going back to the screen here. I talked about the three presets that you can program and have three presets for your own different settings. Say you want like a really quick spin up time, uh, you want a full auto rapid fire high, you know, fire rate setting, and you want like a, a long range high power single shot setting. Uh, you can do that with this blaster and you can set all three and it's awesome. I really like that feature. However, accessing them is not the cleanest or smoothest with the way this is all set up because you have to go through the menus here with the knob and then push and select and, and it's clunky. It's a little clunky and it's not the smoothest function when you're out on the field in the middle of a game and you want to quickly switch to something. Um, I would love some kind of selector switch you can hit with your thumb. You know, if you can make it ambidextrous so you can uh, set it on one side or the other. So that way, if someone's left-handed or right-handed, they can remove it and place it on their side and they can quickly access it with their thumb and be able to set their presets and just select and go on the go like that. I think that would be awesome. That would be a great improvement in terms of uh, my personal thoughts there. That's going to do it for the cons in terms of things I think are, are strictly cons, but let's talk about some personal preference issues. In terms of aesthetics, it's not the prettiest blaster in the world, though some people do like it, so I'm putting this in the personal preference area. Um, it's, it's functional looking, and if you're into that, that's awesome. For me, it leaves a little bit to be desired, but the reason I'm not too hung up on this is uh, Project FDL has talked about the fact that they are aware of a lot of the issues that people have with this blaster and they are working to remedy them or improve them in the future with the FDL-3. So I'm not too concerned or upset about this. And I think that's a good thing that they're listening and they're ready to uh, take a look at things and see where they can improve them. But I know if I didn't mention it, there would be comments all over the place talking about the aesthetics and how it looks and all of that. So just wanted to talk about it real quick. Uh, despite that, despite the fact that it's not maybe the best looking blaster in the world, I really, really like the customization options they're starting to add and improve upon and things like that. Uh, even little simple things that they're doing. For one, for example is this little Picatinny side rail thing. You can move it forward and backward however you want because there's a bunch of screw ports in this top right here that I think that's just one of those little touches that I really like and really appreciate about the FDL in general. So that's personal preference points plus and minus. So it goes back and forth there. Uh, next up, the big one for me that I, I'm sure I'll get a bit of guff from uh, from the FDL users that are big on it. I don't like the fact that there is no rev trigger or main trigger here. Um, it's my personal preference. I know a lot of people have gotten very used to it and just having a single button push and not having to worry about your rev trigger. But to me, there's downsides not having that. I really like the control of a two, uh, two trigger setup, being able to rev when I want and fire when I want. Now, the argument can be made that you still have the same amount of rev up time and fire time. That's true. However, you get to control when that is. So if I'm coming around a corner and I wanna start my rev so I can take my shot at the, the soonest moment that I want to, I can do that right before I pull the corner and I can hold 
And if there's nobody around that corner, I don't have to shoot. I can be all right, I'll let off the trigger, rev trigger, no problem, no, no darts wasted. However, if I want to do something like that with the FDL, I have to pull the trigger at the right time as I'm pulling the corner, hope there is an opposing player there, and hope that I'm aiming in the right position or that I can adjust in the short amount of time that I pull the corner, see the person before or after I've pulled the trigger already, if especially if I have a high rev up time. So there's a lot more variables that get added as opposed to being able to control that rev and know exactly when you want to pull that trigger to fire that dart. So that to me is one of the reasons I really, really prefer the two stage or the two trigger setup, not two stage. Um, to me, it's just one of those things that on top of that, you can also put pressure on players just by revving. This is happened, something that happens all the time and you can see it in some of my videos and other people's videos. When you rev, people take notice. If you rev at somebody, especially in like a competitive game or something, and they're peeking their head above cover to try and get information, you pop up and rev, they have to then make the decision is, are they gonna shoot a dart at me? Or are they revving? Or what do I do? Do I, do I risk this? Do I drop my head? And you can then control a little bit more the, the way information is gathered on the field with that simple rev trigger press. And it's something that adds value, it adds flexibility, which is one of the things I really liked about this blaster, except for that part. You don't get that flexibility here. And that's a bit of a downside to me. Now, I know a lot of you that have FDLs like the single button, and that's great. If it works for you, that's awesome. It just isn't my favorite thing. And as for the button itself, it's a soft pull. It's a soft feeling. It's kind of mushy. It's not, it doesn't give a tactile feedback or response. And you have to push it all the way down to get your shot off. It's, it's something I got used to the more I used it and I didn't hate it like I did the first time I pulled the trigger or pushed the button. It's acceptable to me. I can deal with it, but I'm not happy about it and it's not desirable to me. So that's my viewpoint on the whole trigger situation. When the FDL3 is designed, if they have different options or maybe there's a way you can offer either the single button or a uh, two trigger setup, that would be cool if you had that option available. Now I know that would likely cause much more in terms of design and uh, changing the way things work for each version. So maybe that won't happen, but it's something I still would love to see. A positive thing in terms of personal preference though is the fact that uh, they are continuing to offer more and more customization options and I would prefer they continue to expand that and grow that uh, when it moves on to the FDL3 to add more options for people, more things to customize their blaster and make it feel theirs, like it's their own blaster. Uh, they, I know they've gotten to a lot of things uh, with custom filaments and hydro dipping and all that kinds of stuff. Um, but really the more in terms of like, if you can offer different stock options with uh, the battery, again, in a stock that I know if you don't want to use a stock, that could be an issue, but I think it's a better option than the battery in the grip here. I, I really, really do. Unless you can find a place to put it somewhere else in the blaster, which maybe you can, I, I you're creative people. So, but if you offer different battery stocks, that people could put onto their blaster. Uh, I like what you're doing with the extended muzzle with, with the Picatinny that's adjustable. Just the, the customization. I think that's a great thing, especially for a high-end product. It is imperative that people feel attached to their blaster, that it is theirs, it is their own, it is unique, and it is special for the amount of money that they are putting down for these. Now, I like what they've been doing with things like the custom face plates here. That's a good thing. You're adding more things. Keep doing it. That's a big thumbs up from me. I really like that. So I think you're, you're onto something good with that. To bring it all back together, my final thoughts on this. It's a good blaster. It's a very good blaster that I think has a well-deserved crowd of people that really like it. It's not perfect, however, and there are places this blaster can continue to grow and improve. And what I love 
is that Project FDL has acknowledged that and they want to continue to improve. That's one of the reasons I am so uh, such a big fan of other uh, makers that continue to, to iterate and build and work on their platforms. And this, this is no different. Continue to make this better, continue to grow this, continue to do good. Because if you continue to fix and build those, those downsides into positives, this could continue to be a far, just far, far better blaster than it already is. So if the things that I mentioned as the cons aren't too big of a deal for you, this is definitely worth it. This is a fun blaster to own, to operate, uh, just to see where our hobby of creators and, and, and marketplace has gone. This is a great piece of tech that I'm excited to see continue to grow. And I think that's where really it is for me is that I'm excited to see the future of this platform with the FDL3. So I don't know when that's gonna be. That's the thing. It could be way out that we see the FDL3. So if you like this, I don't know that I would say wait for the FDL3, but if you're on the fence and you're not certain you wanna see what there is to offer, maybe wait for the FDL3. This is a great blaster as it is, but I think it could be better. And I think honestly, if they add that two, two, uh, two trigger setup, I'll be first in line to throw money at them. I, 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 I would fall in love with this blaster, I think, if those two triggers were there. That's again, my personal preference, my final thoughts on this, but I like it. I, again, I like it. I think we'll leave it with that. I like it, but it's not perfect. There's room to grow. And that's the great thing is I know they're gonna continue to grow uh, based on the things they have said and things like the DV Test podcast and other uh, Facebook group posts. So uh, with that said, leave your thoughts on this blaster. What do you think uh, of it? Do you think it has room to grow? Like I said, do you think it's already an amazing platform? Uh, do you plan on buying one in the future? What do you think of the price points? All of your thoughts, leave them down below. I love getting conversations started and seeing things. Maybe I missed something. Did I miss anything? Add your thoughts down below. I love hearing from all of you. And I seriously am looking forward to seeing the future of this blaster. Whenever it happens, uh, I'll be looking forward to it. Until then, um, I'm going to try and probably run this again at some games if I can get it out of get a Thundercrunk's hand to, to, to run it some more because it's definitely an interesting platform and I want to run it at a high power game. I still have not done that. So look out for an update when I do that. I'll be sure to link it up here if I do. But with that said, if you enjoyed this video, feel free to hit that subscribe for more in the future. And as always, thank you so much for watching. I'm Jangular and I'll see you next time.